Welcome to the Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. My name is Dr. Adriana Popescu. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and leader in the field of mental health, energy psychology, addiction, trauma, and empowerment. In this podcast, we will be exploring mental health from a variety of perspectives, from the spiritual to the shamanic and beyond. What if mental illness isn't everything we think it is? What if everything we see as a pathology is actually a possibility? What else is possible with mental health? Hi everyone, Dr. Adriana Popescu here with you today with another exciting episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. And I'm actually really excited today for our guest. She's actually one of Firebird's own, our newest addition to the Firebird team, Shireen Rodemaker. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist, a registered art therapist, life coach, and certified EMDR and energy psychology practitioner. She loves to help facilitate personal and professional breakthroughs on all levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, and loves to work with her clients on creating a life they've dreamed of, embracing who they are, and moving through the traumas and limitations that have held them back. So happy to introduce Shireen. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to talk about art and art therapy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And this isn't this is not a topic we've covered on the podcast so far. So it's going to be fun for me to explore as well. So we're going to talk a little bit today, basically about what role does creativity play in the healing process. But mm-hmm. as you all know, uh, I always like to start off the show with finding out more about our guests. Tell us more about your story and how it is you came to be doing this type of work. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Well, this happened really early on. So like when I was around six years old, I, um, I was really my, I was in first grade and my teacher thought I was on top of the class. I was the best reader, right? Everyone thought I was the best reader, but what, what we found out, um, in like, you know, parent meetings at at school is that I didn't really know how to read. I just have a really good memory. So I have dyslexia. So I just memorized all the books. So I became the top reader because I knew them all the books. And so from there, they're like, oh, we need to test her or something. She has a learning disability. So in, when you have a learning disability, um, in elementary school, they, at the time when I was growing up, they do testing every year. And the testing is, really long. It's like a whole week of testing with a, with a therapist. And it's really boring if you're, um, six, (laughs) really, really boring, except the part where they do art therapy. So they bring in and they let you draw. And at that time, I really, I mean, I come from a family of artists and like, they would bring in the crayons and they'd have you draw your feelings and draw all this. And, um, when I was six, I was like, what part of testing is this? And they said, oh, this is the art therapy part. Um, cause it's like draw yourself and all my drawings are very, very happy and like very, um, brilliant and, um, and bright. And, um, I, I decided then they're like, this is the art therapy part. And I was like, I want to be this cause this was fun. This was free. This was like, not in the box of like, pick this one or this, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't aligned with, um, you know, questions and only one right answer. It was like a freedom and it was me showing up on the page. And I was like, I want to do this. I want to help people with this because the rest of the stuff in school for me was very like ugh, confining. And I was always out of the box. Like I'm, I learned differently. So, um, that was a part. And I decided right then in the moment, I was like, I want to be an art therapist. So that's where it came from. That's Amazing. where I am. My passion. Yeah. Yeah, and to know at such a young age, it's even younger than than I got my ahas. I think I knew by like 15 or 16 that I wanted to do this work. Um, but I'm somebody who, and let's talk about this. I'm somebody who, I also had an artist of her mother, and, um, and she was super talented, and I knew it. And early on, I kind of got the idea I'm not that good at art. And I don't know if it was because I was comparing myself to her or because I couldn't draw or paint the things she did I liked it it was fun for me to play with crayons and paints and stuff but at some point along the way I got the message that I'm not good at this can you talk because I think this is true for a lot of people can you talk about that a little bit 
Yes. And I think that's what really shows up on, um, and a lot of times in therapy or groups when I say, okay, we're going to do art now. Everyone's like, oh no, you know? Um, and especially I imagine being a child and having an adult who's an artist, who's been trained in it, you know, who has been practicing and working and learning that modality is that they are mastery in it. Right. And if you're younger, you're not like, you're still practicing, you're still learning. Um, and so what happens is like certain fears come in when, um, art is being asked, um, a lot of judgment, right? So you come against your, the critical mind of like, I can't do this. It's not going to look as good as someone else. Um, yet I, what I've seen once you go past that, it, like once it's just the process, it's the process of doing it. And so usually what happens is your inner critic comes in and it's great to know like where your inner critic is and it comes in and then through the process of like, I usually just bring in scribbling, like starting with scribbling, because when you cross over the lines, the midlines of connecting the right and left brain, scribbling, you bring your inner two-year-old, then you can have some fun, right? And um, it's creative, it's fun. It's not anything that you're going to be judging because who can judge scribbles? You know, <laughs> so I start off with that and it, it brings you back to that early place of creativity where, you know, um, a lot of us, when we're younger, we're brilliant. Like we can do, we can, we're having fun. We're free. Um, somewhere when we become an adult, we start going, we have to be this, we have to be that and comparing yourself to your parents, like you said. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you said to me earlier that, that art is really our first language, you know, can you say a little bit more about that? Well, when you look back at like petroglyphs, right, that's how we communicated. We, they drew the scene, they drew what was happening. Right. And so that is how other people would communicate. They look at caves and they say, Oh, this is a story. Um, that was a language because everyone had like different dialects. Right. But through art and images, they knew what was happening. They could see the story. So that was yes, their stories, right? Through those petroglyphs and the hieroglyphs. And, you know, that's what archaeologists spend all this time trying to decipher. What is the story that's being told here through these images, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, highlight something you just said before about the judging. Um, yeah, I think what happens, and maybe you can comment on this, but, you know, a lot of us had art class in school. And um, it often seemed to be a lot about the finished product. And you said something about process. And, and, and I had a very different experience from art classes in, you know, um, grammar school, middle school. I think we even had art in high school. That was a different experience for me than when I was in graduate school at, at a very, um, you know, the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. We actually had a creative expression class. And I remember in that, it was not about the finished product at all. In fact, when you presented your work to the class, nobody could comment or give you feedback on it. Mm. And, oh, I love that. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And then so it really, I started to understand that this is much more about the process. It's not about the finished product. It's, in fact, sometimes I would just like crumple up or throw away the, the finished product because it wasn't about that per se. It was about mm -hmm. like what was happening for me as I'm in the flow of my experience, emotions are coming out, you know, it's, it's that flow process. That's really the key more so than in some cases, maybe, and we can talk about some variations on that. And sometimes it's not really about the finished product. It's not like anyone's going to be buying your art or, you know what I mean? Or critiquing it or whatever. Anyways, can you say more about that? Yes. And exact. well, it's about like getting things out of you. Right. So like sometimes what I've noticed is like, it's the process. Um, it's almost like what I had, the way I explain it when I work with people is almost like dream work, right? We have these dreams and it's the unconscious comes out on the paper and then we can look at them. We can see them. And, it, and so sometimes what shows up, I'll, I'll just ask like, Hey, just do a free drawing. And people just draw something and they're like, and we'll look at it and we'll talk about it and we'll see like, hey, this is exactly what's happening with me. Um, but they weren't able to communicate it. It just kind of unconsciously comes through the paper um, and surprise. And it's also like a release, like sometimes we're holding things on our body and we're like caught and like we get it out on paper. And it's like then there's a freedom. We're able to talk about it. Um, and we go up against our fears. Like at first you have to get over like, oh, you know, the, the scary part. But when, when you're doing art, like it shows up, everything always shows up. Um, every time I do a session, 
it's always surprising to me like what comes in the room because it's always through art exactly what this person wanted to work on and they usually leave after doing art they're feeling free there's a freedom to it um because it's a release of of something we're holding inside getting it on the paper and doing that process um and I, I feel like when you're doing the process it's like you're meeting yourself you're meeting yourself you're you're getting this out and you're feeling more like you it's a very energetic yeah. yeah. And I think that's the part that can be hard for people in our kind of Western intellectual linear, you know, left brain kind of way of thinking. I think mm -hmm. that, that people have sometimes have a hard time understanding what is the value of doing things this way. You know, we can't scientifically prove it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, yes. And I do think that they are proving some things like there is a whole thing about art therapy and neuroscience. I'm not an expert on that piece, but there's so many books coming out about that. Um, drawing with your non-dominant hand, bringing in, connecting your brain for like neurologically connecting things. A lot of, um, I've done a lot of work with children and with people with Parkinson's, with Alzheimer's. Um, it's just, it's really a modality that you can use through different, like different process with stress, depression, trauma. Um, you can use it in any way. It's, it's a really great modality that helps get you to the, um, you know, the, the helps, helps like get you to the point where you come into therapy, where you're working on yourself and it gets you through. Mm -hmm. process it gets you to the goal i love what you just said because i'm thinking now it really transcends language i think we're in, especially again in the west you know we're so dominant with verbal communication and language and when you're talking about kids or you're talking about people with various conditions debilitating conditions where maybe they don't have access to language you know kids can't I want to highlight this for a moment, you know, with kid therapy, because kids don't, if you send a kid to therapy, the therapist isn't going to be ta necessarily going to be talking to them about their problems the way an adult might, right? With a kid, we do play therapy. We do something called scantre, which I want us to get into a little bit as well. Um, or we might do art. And so what is it ab about that for kids or again, people who maybe language isn't as easily accepted? Uh, accessible or even people who can speak, you know, like what, what do you think that is that's so valuable in working with these populations? Yeah. Yes. And I can only speak from my, like, from my experience working with kids with like have seen traumas, like they don't see murders. A lot of my, the kids that I worked with had seen murders. They just come in, they'd write it out. They draw it on the paper, exactly what they saw. And, um, and then they, they would tell the story. It's like, it's kind of connecting in the trauma. You tell your story. Um, kids can't just verbalize their story. What happened? They just drew it out and then they showed it to me. And then they were like, okay. Like they were able to go back to class and they were able to function where they weren't functioning um, in the class at all. So it's like really, it really is a modality that can just get it out, you know, get the thing out and then move on um, fast. I think that answers what you, you asked me. Is it, was that, did I touch all the pieces? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm even remembering, you know, I don't, I haven't worked with kids a whole lot in my career, but you know, early on in my training I did. And I do remember we learned in school in graduate school, we do learn even in, um, I mean, you specialized in art therapy and I'm curious to find out actually more about what that education was like, but even in sort of basic, you know, therapist training, you do learn about, um, how to interpret some of the things that can come up in these more creative, um, healing modalities. Like for example, I remember um, having a kid uh, that I was seeing as a client do, I don't even know that I directed him specifically towards write, you know, draw about your trauma. I think I just left it open-ended. Um, and in the pieces, you know, the finished uh, drawings, I was able to see like, again, sort of like dreams. Like we talk about symbology and dreams, right? Mm -hmm. A tiger might mean this or, or, um, you know, a, a, a face without a, a mouth might mean something, you know, like, th and we are able to get valuable information about what that person's been through based on the images and the symbols that come out of their pieces. And I was kind of fascinated with that. Like, wow, you can kind of read what this kid's story is by 
And he drew a picture of an airplane, but it was the way it was drawn, you know, and mm-hmm. it kind of looked a little bit phallic. And, you know, there were just certain little telltale signs that really gave me pieces of information about what was going on for him in his subconscious and what his subconscious was trying to work out. Cause that's even what dreams are, right? It's our subconscious, like processing material and trying to like work things out. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yes. And there are certain modalities that there are certain, um, we'll, we'll say like, Hey, um, processes that would be like, Hey, can you draw this? And we are looking for certain things and then we're not. So it's kind of like we are, and we're not because, um, where I would like to say, like, start with this is like, first of all, we're all like, when we're in school, we're taught to draw in certain ways. Right. So some people are like, you have to draw a tree this way. And that's how they learned it. So it's really, we have to ask some questions. We have to say like, okay, I'm curious. Let's talk to this paper paper you drew this can you tell me why and a lot of times it's like what well, was taught at fifth grade that you can only draw trees this way right and so this is how i'm doing and this this is how it's showing up however even though like so you have to ask some questions you can't just be like oh that's what that means you know even you can see things like through there are certain you know things we can read from like house tree person like this shows up and and there's a like you can see this but you do want to ask questions and you want to know like, Hey, what does this mean to you? And through that conversation and talking with the piece, it opens up a place where they, they were like, wow, I can't believe I shared so much. I can't believe this all came out. Um, I haven't told anyone this ever. And it came out through an art piece that they had no idea. And like dreams, it's like the unconscious, it comes out the things you really want to work on, but you kind of stuffed it back there and it shows, and it shows up in that way. And so, For me, um, I usually try not to like go like, oh, this looks like a penis. It must mean this. Right. And so (laughs) because it's like you kind of want to look at like, hey, you know, ask some questions and it could be like, oh, this is how I was taught to draw it. And so being curious about like what is showing up and just being curious and why did this person choose this? Um, But usually when you look at if you take the piece back, you hold the, the paper up and talk to it, you can see some things. And and usually the person's like, Oh, I see this, this is what's coming up for me. And going with what the person knows, and what's showing up. That's usually the way I go with it, unless it is like a house tree person where there are certain things like this means this, this means this and analyzing um, what's coming on the page. So I do try to kind of stay away from that, but it does come up like it does, like everything comes in, in such a beautiful way and such a healing way. Mm-hmm. Um, on the page that's what I've noticed yeah yeah and and that people are actually able I want to say this piece people are actually able to resolve uh issues through the art they don't necessarily have to talk it out again I'm, I'm coming back with kids and my somewhat limited experience with kids but you know there was a time when I also did some Santra I did Santra for even for myself because I wanted to play that I love it yes Let's talk a little bit about sand tray or sand play therapy Mm -hmm. and what is that and what is kind of the, what's happening there when, when it's commonly used for kids, but there's definitely, especially Jungian, you know, people who kind of Mm -hmm. espouse Carl Jung's work. He was very into symbolism. Uh, Jungians often, even for adults, will have a sand tray available as part of the therapy. So yeah, tell us more about that. Yes. Okay. Sand tray. Like, and I'm not an expert at sand tray. I will just say that, but I am an expert of like talking to the pieces that come in and we do, that's what I do with all my clients is, um, I do have sand tray, um, in some of my work and I, I use it with adults, teens and children. Um, and it's play, it's connecting. First of all, it's connecting back. Um, it's not a language at, at first. It's like a sand and then you can see some water. Like we definitely like in all the trays, you can see a water connection and it's like creating a scene. And usually I'll take a picture and I'll ask like, Hey, what's happening here? And always what comes out just like art is usually the same. The, it's like a process, you know, um, the process of like putting a tiger on having this, you know, having with, with, um, siblings, it's usually dinosaurs like fighting, Cause, and they work out the fighting and they show like, oh, this is a, the dinosaur that never always loses and you'll see it and you'll see it in the tray. Um, and it's like, and then from there, it's like they almost work it out in the tray and they don't have to talk about it. There's no talking. There's It's nonverbal language that happens. And it's like in the psyche and it's like, okay, we did this work. 
Yes, and for people who don't know what sand tray is, it's basically like a <clears throat> like a tray, you know, of a certain size, like maybe like a small table, right? And it's up high on and uh, often on like wheels. Sometimes so you can move it around, and it's there's sand in it about you know this deep, and then there's figures. There's usually like a whole wall in someone's office of little figures of like all the, like the kinds of things kids would play with, like little toy army soldiers or different animals, right? And the, the person who's doing the sand tray gets to pick any piece they want and they get to put it in the tray in any kind of configuration. I mean, sometimes I've seen like, you know, things like upside down or yeah, two, two creatures are fighting or you see that like, you know, one person is over here with their back turned and the other person is way across the sand tray over here. And and you can, I think, get uh, information. Like I certainly, when I did it for myself, I saw some things like, wow, like I hadn't, like that makes sense to me. That fits for what I've got going on. But even when the person can't cognitively process what it is, again, in the case of, let's say, little kids who don't have that, you know, developed brain yet, they yet are able to symbolically work some things out that otherwise they might be doing in real life. Like you talk about siblings fighting, right? Oftentimes kids end up in therapy because they're getting physical, you know, fist fights, kicking, biting, you know, they're getting in trouble at school. And if you can put them into some play therapy and they can get some of that anger, or aggression, like whatever's driving that behavior, if they can get it out in the tray, then maybe they don't have to do it with uh, the kids at school or their siblings or whatever. Right. Yes. Yes. When I worked in the schools, that's exactly what would happen in the trays. Like we, I had a tray, and they, it is like from like the the order of the tray. There's like rocks until like now to like futuristic stuff, and there's a certain order to it, and and it's a combination of yeah, like your younger self, your older self, and like so much happens in the tray. It's such a big work. Um, and like kids would come in, they would be bullied, or they'd be bullied, and they like hide things, and they would like you know in the tray and like protect things and like having a protector, but not feeling protected. And um, a lot of things would come out and, and a lot of, you know, like, Hey, there's abuse happening and you would see it, but you would have never known. Um, okay. because when they start talking about in the tray, um, so it, it's really is a modality of just symbols, um, instead of language of having to really say like, Hey, this is what's happening. And a lot of people are scared too. So it comes out in the tray and it's a safe place. Um, and it gets worked out so that there, the, you can put a voice to it. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's the same thing as art too, is like, once it's on the page, there is a voice you can talk about it, but it's a lot of those things where people are like, I never want to talk about this and they hold it inside. Yeah. Right. They're not okay. Yeah. I want to talk to the healing professionals for a moment. Um, you know, our fellow therapists and whatnot who, who may not use this work, you know, who, again, may have their own issues around like, I'm not a good artist or uh, art makes me uncomfortable if I have to do it because of the things we've talked about. So I think sometimes, you know, or maybe we just don't get good training. I'd like to find out more about like what kind of training is out there for therapists. I mean, you went to a specialized school and, and got a certification, right, or degree in, in it. But I'm, yeah, I'm curious just for our professionals to know, like, what else, and then I want to talk about other applications of this too, but like, what would be good for us to know about the value of this work? And even if we don't consider ourselves skilled in all this, like, is there something we can learn from it, you know, through a workshop or something? Hmm. Yes. Like, and I think it's the power of play too. First, like whenever I bring in, I want to start with whenever I bring in crayons, you know, adults freak out. Oh, this is childish. I don't want to touch this. Right. This is what you do when you're five. Um, yeah. Then they do. They, you know, that they do it. And once they do it, that, that sense of joy, that inner child comes in the room, which is super healing, can be super healing. It can touch into like that freedom where like play creativity comes in and through that opening up the, the room to joy and creativity 
um, brings so much healing. And, um, I think that like what I would say, there's so many different, there's so many different books. There's so many right now. Um, there's a lot of funding towards art cause they're finding like a neuroscience. There's so much going on when you're doing art. It's, um, you're in, you know, your brain is like, like you're connecting in, you're in, using different pieces of your brain. Um, it's almost like I always have people who are really depressed or, um, have a ton of anxiety do art page every day and that could just be a scribble it could be a drawing it can be like very meditative work just drawing what's in front of you like a, your glass even if you do it wrong do it at the non-dominant hand don't look um because it, it's firing the brain it's like exercising it's like it, it's similar things it, it changes um a different aspect of your brain because you're doing something different um, and you're using different pieces of your brain. Um, I think that you wanted to talk about different types of, um, your, what was it? Um, when you're using like left brain, right brain kind of stuff. Or you said drugs, like different types of, um, you know, not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do want to talk about that. Um, but just one more piece on this. Yeah. What I remember, um, you know, art therapy being super valuable for, um, as, a professional is especially with when you're working with your adults to do inner child work. Um, and, and it isn't, I mean, maybe this is, you know, we think of this more as writing. I think a lot of what you're saying also applies to journaling, you know, about getting it out, getting it on paper. Um, but the non-dominant hand stuff, not only, I mean, I think a lot of therapists know this technique, right? Um, when you can actually do something like inner child work, where you have kind of, you know your dominant hand i'm right-handed your dominant hand is like your adult self and then the non-dominant hand becomes like the child self right because with your with my left hand my writing looks like a little kids and that you can do dialoguing between these two parts and that sometimes really interesting stuff can come up um again that you weren't totally aware of and if you're doing parts work is so popular right now um, I think there's so many applications. Like I learned parts therapy as psychosynthesis, which is one of the earliest versions. But I remember um, we had to do something creative with our subpersonalities, which is like these different parts that we have. Like I have a wounded inner child. I have an angry teenager. You know, I have a, I had a, for me, I had a fire breathing road rager. <laughs> that was very much my East Coast, New York uh, <laughs> aggressiveness. And so I did a collage, collage work. We could talk about vision board, actually. Let's talk about that, those things for a minute. I did a collage where I cut out different pieces from magazines and different things. I even um, like had some tarot cards that I made like a color copy of and took that symbolism and um, created this collage where all the parts were like where I put them in orientation to each other and what different symbols represented was like super powerful for me and really and again it's hard to put these things in words but it's like it gave me um a greater understanding and insight into my own psyche and all these different parts of myself who are often in conflict with each other um or i could see where through my images like there was like this old wise healing woman you know like medicine woman type you know like how could she help this like wounded child part who's stuck in some trauma or whatever can you comment a little bit on that stuff too because a lot of people use vision boards collages different things like that as well too. yeah yes and i use a lot i use i call it glue books like we do glue books with teenagers and so it's like taking a magazine and doing almost every page making a collage of different stories so different aspects of yourself to come in and so it's like it's really powerful and then you have a book um, you know, that you can bring in and it's like work that you can continually work on. I do that. Um, we do the collage and, um, and definitely the process as a group, we do collage. We'll do a collage as a group running. I run an IOP program. Um, and what will come in is like everyone's fears and their joy. And then it's like, there's this beautiful piece and together they're like, wow, we we've created something amazing and it connects the group. Um, and then individually, um, just having your parts, you know, like seeing the separate pieces, but coming in at whole, like that's usually what happens through, um, collage work. I really love glue books. Um, you said, are there resources out there? And there is, there's, I mean, like you can, go, you can just go on YouTube and see glue books and there's so many different teachings. Um, there's so many different books on art therapy and, 
uh, there's so many people who run programs um, for therapists, you know, like a lot of healers that need processing. If you're doing some hard work, if you're, you know, doing working with a lot of people in trauma, you need to process too and heal. So there's a lot of like art therapy modalities and you can learn some techniques um, what to use during, you know, sessions or um, a lot of even doctors are using this with a lot of cancer patients doing art and doing art for their patients too. So I, I see it a big, there's so, you asked, um, where can people learn from this? And I did go to school for this and training, but there is a lot of things online. Um, we, you and I should do a class to help some people, well, you know, art. what my vision actually is, cause we want to do, especially starting this year at Firebird, you know, we want to start having healing retreats and workshops, including ones for professionals to, yeah rejuvenate and like recover from the intensity of the work that we do. And, and a big piece of that is I vision it is having you leading us in some kind of group based, you know, art therapy, because I think you're right. The group piece, not only do you get like your own personal um, value and experience, you know, in that experience, but there's something collective about the group, you know, it tends to exponentialize things. So Doing these types of activities in a group is also extremely powerful. So yeah, I would love that for Firebird and to have you leading us in that. Um, and that also kind of is a nice bridge to this last piece I wanted to talk about with um, integration work for psychedelic assisted therapies. Um, for a long time, you know, uh, I have been following this movement since I was a freshman in college when I first discovered the work of Dr. Stan Groff, who's considered like an OG of psychedelic assisted therapies. He was working at, he's a psychiatrist who was working at Johns Hopkins back in the sixties and uh, doing research on LSD and the value of LSD in psychotherapy. And, you know, because these people, when you're taking a psychedelic, you're having this sort of other world, you know, potentially having an otherworldly experience that goes beyond language, it goes beyond words. And so early on, Stan and his colleagues realized that, for people to make sense of these experiences, they weren't necessarily going to be able to just talk in language about it. So they started, to, you know, bringing in art, like, well, you know, draw or paint your experience. Um, and then it, people could look at it, you know, and then see, oh, wow, you know, maybe it would make some kind of sense to them or whatever it was. It was just a, like we said before, the process of getting it out, whatever got stirred up in that experience is now coming out in this way. And when LSD and other psychedelics were outlawed, Stan developed this beautiful modality called holotropic breathwork, um, which also involves getting into altered states of consciousness, but without drugs um, through your breath. And I was doing a lot of this in, in, col in college, in graduate school. And um, I remember, you know, we would gather as a group to prepare for the experience. And then you had a whole day, it would be a, work a weekend workshop. You'd have a whole day of doing the experience. And then we would do integration work with, in this case, it was mandalas, which are, I mean, you can even tell us more about that, these circles, right? And then inside the circle, you can put like draw, whatever, or sometimes, you know, in, in uh, Nepal or places like that, the monks are doing mandalas with sand and different things, right? Um, and I don't know, it was just, again, really powerful to share your experience with your fellow people in your group. And I feel like we all got something out of it. So I know that with this resurgence in the psychedelic movement, we have a lot of people now who are adding in um, this art piece for integration of those experiences. So can you just comment on any of that? I know I said a lot. <laughs> yeah, this, well, and like you're accessing other parts of your brain that you haven't been accessing, right? So you were tapping into a whole different, like you, where you've just kind of, especially with trauma and stuff, you're only in this finite part of your brain, like, seconds and now you have this whole expansive place so yes you're at act accessing your brain and beyond right and then you're able to put it on paper um and then when you talk to you about mandalas it's like mandalas are a very container it's a container of a circle right and the circle is a very powerful symbol and it's like then you're able to have a container and you're able to put anything in there and and it's safe and it's and it's powerful and and um my understanding of mandalas what i've learned there's different things that come and show up and show where you're at in stages um and then and so it's like you kind of go through different stages in mandalas and some are just like organic um 
a place where you haven't been before and they, they show up and you can see and they're in a safe place. Um, and dollars have been used like for many years. Ancient, it's like ancient oh, work. You know? Yeah. yeah. And, and and yeah, it, it, they're so powerful because it is holding that space and like therapy, a container for things to come in and have allowance for it to be there and just to hold that space. And, and, um, that's basically what I would say about mandalas and, um, and, t- and tapping into that area is that you haven't tapped before. And, and when you, um, do get to those places, it's like, then you're like, what do I do? Cause this is so different. You don't, you know, it's like, you're so different. You're like, I now I've hit this place. Now how do I come back to my life? Right. And so having this mandala, having that peace is, um, a new kind of like a bridge into like walking into bringing your experience and now being that in the world. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's such powerful stuff. And I just come back to, you know, art as like our primary language and throughout cultures and for tens of thousands of years, if not longer, um, we've been as humanity expressing ourselves in, in many other ways than besides just the verbal. Um, so I love that we've been having this conversation. If somebody wanted to get started, you know, you talked about with your clients, you know, just start with scribbles. Like, how would you recommend someone who maybe has never explored art therapy before, you know, aside from going to someone like yourself, who obviously can guide them in this process, if they were just wanting to play a little bit on their own, maybe dare to buy a box of crayons or markers or something, what would you suggest? Yeah, I would suggest like going into the store and, and just asking yourself like what seems fun, you know, um, what seems fun, um, what would be, you know, playful, what what they're drawn to because everyone, um, like we kind of, we all do art in a different way. Some people do it through clothing. Some people do it um, through pencils, pens, uh, like doodling. Um, so really clay. just like, clay. Okay. Oh, clay is no, so Clay is amazing. Clay is like that really embodied, organic. Um, clay is very powerful. Um, so yeah, I would. I just would look at like what two things. I look at what what excites you. What what are you comfortable with, and what scares you? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes what scares you is really where you might want to look in and try it. Um, so there's usually classes. Um, there's so many YouTube videos on different types of art. Um, glue books collage i think that just doing a vision board of like bringing in collage and seeing through images what's coming up what is it you want to bring in um unconscious work at poems i feel like poems are very powerful too it's definitely just doing poetry um it can be a piece of artwork too there's mm-hmm. art model it goes from like crayons to poems to paint to <laughs> clay to everything you know um nature there's so much art you can do in nature just with with rocks with seashells with leaves i remember being a kid do you remember doing this as a kid um before i moved to new york where that wasn't really an option in new york city but i would go outside and um like we would gather leaves and put them you know glue them into a, a picture or something with the crayons and you would have something textured underneath and you would put a piece of paper on there remember and do the crayon and that way you could get the texture of like the ground or a rock or I don't know what. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And what shows up and what comes out and what you get to see. Yes. I do remember that. I love that so much. And be really beautiful. because it, I, it, Yeah. I remember also really loving my fluorescent crayons. When fluorescent crayons <laughs> came out, I thought that was the most amazing thing because those were the colors that spoke to me and I hardly ever saw them anywhere. <laughs> So to be able to have crayons that would allow me to like play with those colors, like I remember that was made me super happy. So maybe it's time for me to go buy a box of fluorescent crayons. Definitely. I think that, yeah, your iridescent self. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> be, right? You can see it in my personality and adult coloring books. So that's another one. If you're an adult mm-hmm. and you want to kind of just dip your toe in the water, nowadays they have these incredible adult coloring books. I actually have packed mine away because I'm getting ready to move, but I would have shown you. I even have one. You spoke of, of fashion as art. I That's one way I express myself creatively is through fashion. My mom being the fashion designer, of course, that's kind of, that was her artistry as well. Um, 
and I and <laughs> and I have I got a coloring book that had different fashion styles through the ages. So like, or, and there was a lot of '60s. A lot of it is like '60s, which is some of my favorite era of fashion. And it's a coloring book for adults. Very intricate designs on the clothes and stuff. It's yeah. it's pretty fun. And I can tell you, like, after a hard day where I've been, you know, again as a healer, you know, it it can be traumatizing to sit with people's trauma, or it can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're working with folks with intense experiences. So like for me to be able to shut off my like analytical brain and be able to just like color, you know, maybe while some music is on or even the TV's on in the background, for me to be able to do that, I find to be very soothing and um, a good outlet. Yeah. Yes, it's very meditative. So it puts you in that meditative state, yes. right? It's and it's like, down. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're moving. And so you're doing something with your brain too. So you're like, sh like moving it throughout your body. Like you're putting it, you're in, you're in a meditative state and you're also moving it out. So you're not holding it in. You know, right. that's the thing is like, we hold so much in. So it's like letting that go. And it's just it through a very comfortable place through coloring books. So yes. And I, I think I have... I usually do like the, like I said, the um, collage books, like this is a whole magazine of just collages. Mm -hmm. And so it's like every day just kind of doing a page too. And that's just fun and playful. And it's like gluing things and you can glue on top of each other. And um, the glue, I love the glue books, um, painting. Mm -hmm. you know, clay anything um but I, it re goes back to like you talk about being a child and the um the crayons um the fluorescent crayons i i love barbies and um i love barbies so much and they, i would create the like their house and i'd make lampshades out of like the random things and being creative and looking and creating this whole scene yeah it was very like oh like it, it opened my heart and i just loved what it was creating so wow. it's like you can do it within your house too, like interior design, your house. House, space. Yeah. Same thing. Of like you can art is in so many different things. Like it could just be your bathroom, redoing your bathroom, redoing your living room to the place where you walk in and you're like, oh, this space is yours, you know? So um, there's so many different ways of doing art. I still, my entire life, I have loved Christmas lights or mm -hmm. like colored lights. I mm -hmm. always was the person who had like a purple or red light bulb, like, you know, <laughs> and I still in my fifties have um, little Christmas lights, like all over the old school kind, you know, not those LED ones, the old school Christmas lights in all different twinkly colors, because that makes my inner child happy. So um, I'm loving this conversation we've had. Um, I think it's been a super expansive, um, inspiring conversation. Shereen, if people want to find out more about you, about your work, uh, where can they go? They can find me on Firebird with you. They can find me right there. Um, you can just, um, that's really where I say like working with you and finding like definitely through Firebird. I do run some programs in Santa Cruz. Um, and I do have a website, so, um, we could put it on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what's your website? Oh, I want to say it's Shireen 27. <laughs> yeah. I'll send it. I'll give it to you. Yeah. We'll, you can just we'll put it on. in the show notes for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, any final thoughts for us, for our audience? Um, just really, yeah. I, my, th my final thoughts are like, just explore, play, what can you do one thing if you want to create something today what would you like to create and just what just have some fun today play maybe take some pens and crisscross over and see how it feels in your body mm -hmm. the spiral so graph remember that one mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah go to the toy <laughs> store love those. go to the toy store or go to the art <laughs> store or go to a michaels you know craftsy store right and yeah. that's another one, all the crafts, I, the needle point and the crocheting and the knitting, like that's all creative art mm -hmm. stuff too. Like go there and just walk around and let your child, your inner child choose what would be fun to play with and just yeah. explore and see what happens. I love it. Well, thanks so much, Shireen, for being on the show today. Thank you, audience, for tuning in. If you have liked this podcast, please do rate it, review it, share it all the things so we can get it out there in the hands of more people. 
And this is Dr. Adriana signing off. We'll see you next time on Kaleidoscope of Possibilities. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. This has been Dr. Adriana Popescu. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe and share with others. To find out more about me, my guests, and more, please visit my website at adrianapopescu.org. See you next time.